Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jessica New, and I want to welcome you on behalf of the KISS Steering Committee to this short course on understanding and empowering soil management as a climate mitigation option. And as you know, the short course is part of a larger uh, KISS study that will be going on this week, and we're very excited to be hosting it. Um, I'm going to do the flight attendant thing, so there, in case of emergency, there are exits um, in the back and on the sides, um, so please make use of all of the exits. The restrooms for the women are just out the door uh, up at the top of, this, of the um, seating area, and then the men's restrooms are down the stairs and located basically directly under the women's restrooms. Um, and um, we'll be having lunch after the short course um, outside uh, where you had coffee this morning. That's where we'll have an informal lunch as soon as we're done here. So thank you all for attending, and uh, I'd like to introduce um, our study lead, Keith Pastian, and uh, he'll, he'll introduce all of the speakers today. Thank you. So my name is Keith Pastian, and uh, I'm one of the team leads for the KISS study on, the, on mitigation, or managing soil organic carbon for climate mitigation that will be going on here this week. Um, before we get started, on behalf of myself and the other team leads, I'd like to express our deep appreciation to especially Janet Seed and also the entire Keck uh, Institute for Space Studies uh, staff for their excellent job and hard work at, at putting together this, uh, this week-long study. And also, of course, thanks to the Keck Institute for, for funding the, the workshop. Um, and we have uh, four outstanding speakers today for this short course on understanding and empowering soil management as a climate mitigation option. The, the idea with the short course is really for, is for the speakers to provide some foundational uh, presentations on, on key scientific elements that underpin the uh, the work that we'll be doing this week in, in, in continuing on and, and, uh, and investigating this area. Um, so the, the, uh, the short course is, is entitled Understanding and Empowering Soil Management as a Climate Mitigation Option. Our, or I should also note that the, uh, as, as you probably noticed here, the uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the presentations are going to be uh, videotaped, and, uh, but the Q&A sessions will not be videotaped. So feel free to, to, uh, to let it all hang out during the <laughs> Q&A sessions. Um, the, the, the arrangement will be for each speaker to have about 35 minutes. To, to give their remarks. Uh, we're going to have a couple of time timekeepers up here to try to keep things on schedule. But then we'll have about 10, 10 minutes for, for Q&A after that. Um, I think that's probably enough said on my part. Uh, I'd like to introduce the, the first speaker, uh, Dr. Dave Schimmel, who is a senior research scientist at JPL. Dave, uh, as, as he puts it in his biography, Dave works on all things carbon. Um, I know a little bit more about Dave, having uh, he, he got his PhD at Colorado State University, where I am at, and I also have a couple of degrees from that institution. Uh, Dave got his PhD in, in 1982. Um, he, Continued there afterwards on uh, on a, on a postdoc, uh, in which he was was studying uh, soil organic matter dynamics in rangeland ecosystems, and he was one of the the earliest uh, uh, people that were doing soil organic matter modeling in the U.S. You know, at that time, and and a lot of the work that Dave was involved in has has really continued on and been foundational for work not only at Colorado State, but elsewhere in the U.S. and, and really globally. Uh, Dave then went on, uh, after leaving CSU, he, he went on and worked at NASA Ames for a while, 
and then he was um, uh, he was at, at NCAR in Boulder, and then back and forth a little bit, eventually landed here, and I think he's been at JPL, I don't know how many years now, about 10 years at JPL, so, so, uh, so it's really a great pleasure to have David here to uh, give our, our kickoff talk um, on climate, greenhouse gas mitigation, and CO, CO2 removal, a role for soils. So Dave, I've left you also a little bit of extra time, uh, and so uh, we won't have to uh, worry too much then about extra time for the Q&A. So thanks, Dave. Thanks, Keith. I'm going to give an overview of the global carbon cycle and the way in which soils fit into the global carbon cycle as context for everything that will come in, in the week. Um, it, it's important to have sort of a sense of how big the, the critical stocks and fluxes are in the global carbon cycle. The, the terrestrial soils are the second biggest reservoir of carbon in the global system after the oceans. Uh, they're, they're, of course, much, much smaller than the oceans, but very big relative to the atmosphere. There's two or three times as much CO2 in, in soils as there is currently in the atmosphere. And not only are they a critical stock, uh, not only are fluxes in and out of soils critical, but soil processes, of course, regulate and influence all of the other terrestrial fluxes through soil moisture, through nutrient cycles, um, through erosion and deposition and uh, landscape evolution. And so soils are really at, at the heart of understanding the global carbon cycle. Now, this might not seem like the usual subject for JPL. Um, the JPL campus is uh, both close and, and far from here. We're right at the base of the foothills. Uh, most people think of us in relation to Mars, where we study soils mostly, because that's mostly what there is on Mars, lots and lots of soil. Not as different from Earth as you might think in some ways. Um, but um, JPL has a huge earth science activity. About half of our business base revolves around earth science missions, earth science research, and earth science technology. And JPL alone, the NASA fleet of Earth observing satellites is very, very large on any given day, depending on how you count, more like 30 or 40. But these are some of the missions that JPL uh, has flown in the recent past, will flow, fly in the near future, or are on orbit. And you can see that, that many of these activities relate very directly or primarily to soils. For example, SMAP, which monitors soil moisture at kilom many kilometer resolution globally, continuing a much longer record of opportunity, the EMIT mission, which I think will be central to our discussions over the week, is an imaging spectrometer that was actually built to study soil mineralogy in arid lands. It also can retrieve organic carbon, plant nutrients, and a wide variety of other very relevant activities. Um, EcoStress monitors evapotranspiration under the orbit of the International Space Station, so about 75% of the Earth's land surface. So we have, a, we have a big interest in Earth science and a growing interest in soils. Um, interestingly, the carbon cycle and ecosystems activity is now the largest group in our Earth science program. It was not true when I came here, and I'm only incidentally responsible. Um, it's, it's been a, a growing issue for, for NASA and for the country. Um, we have three primary science focus areas, and this workshop actually fits into at least two and perhaps all three of them. We study carbon climate feedbacks with a focus on the high carbon, high carbon flux regions of the world, northern high latitudes, which is all about soils, tropical wet and semi-arid forests, um, and the Southern Ocean, we don't separate between terrestrial and marine. We really are a global carbon cycle activity. And the, the, the individuals at JPL use a wide range of techniques and technologies. 
Uh, remote sensing is almost always a, a part of that, um, but we do field studies, we do airborne science, we have a very strong modeling and data assimilation activity. And, and so this workshop, while it might seem uh, out of, out of uh, family for, uh, for the Jet Propulsion Lab, is in fact a terrific opportunity for us to move into a critical new area. Um, what is it that we're trying to do in studying and managing the global carbon cycle? So we want to manage emissions and enhance uptakes to remain within a carbon budget consistent with a livable climate on planet Earth to avoid or limit the worst damages of climate change. And the way the Earth system works, in the present time, despite warming, despite drought, despite land use change and intensification of agriculture, the living world is still taking up about half of fossil fuel and land use emissions. And I'll talk more about why that might be. It, it isn't mostly down to us. Um, but we know that because of those carbon cycle climate feedbacks, it's not simple to compute the amount of carbon that we can release. It's not linear, nor does the CO2 in the atmosphere have a relatively simple half-life like methane does. In fact, there are both concentration and climate-dependent fluxes between the ocean and the land and the atmosphere such that as you emit more and more CO2, the fate of that CO2 changes a bit. And so in order to arrive at a CO2 concentration consistent with a climate that we want to live in, we can only emit so much carbon. And it is a bit rate dependent, depending on whether it's released early or late. But mostly it depends on the quantity. And this graph shows the relationship between accumulated emissions and the temperature um, change since pre-industrial times. And in models, this relationship is surprisingly linear. But I've kind of indicated in this cartoon style that there could be nonlinear breakpoints at which it becomes more extreme. Or if we're very aggressive and successful at management, we might even dip the, the, this relationship in the, in the other direction by enhancing uptake above what the natural land and ocean fluxes would achieve for us. Now, as Keith said, I actually started out as a soil biogeochemist. I was really not focused on soil organic carbon so much as the nitrogen cycle. Um, but I did participate in the early development of the century and descent models. But my interest was really always at the global scale. And so I did a number of modeling and data synthesis studies looking at global carbon using uh, the century organic matter model. Um, in, in the upper left hand is, uh, I think, the first map globally of soil carbon residence time that came from an early century paper. Um, Anthony Bloom, who's a scientist here at JPL, did an update to that not long ago using data assimilation into, a, into an ecosystem process model. He assimilated a wide range of satellite constraints on productivity, turnover times, residence times, and so on. The, the interesting thing to me is that the, the range of residence times circa uh, the, the late 1920s um, and the late 1990s, not so different. And actually, there are surprisingly many patterns in common. Now, either that first model was really good, which in some ways it was, or there are hard constraints that influence those large-scale patterns, climate, bulk soil properties at very large scales, uh, and the distribution of biomes. And, and um, our challenge is to do better than that. It, so on the one hand, that early model might have been very good. On the other hand, it does suggest that our understanding of fine detail hasn't really changed all that much. Now, that, that first model is informed by a few hundred data points. Um, that latter map is informed by many millions of data points. 
and they're not that different, which is uh, instructive. So the global carbon cycle, this is um, the first of these block diagrams that the IPCC published. Um, it was actually done by a, a woman who became a rather famous soil scientist, Elizabeth Salzman. Um, and it, and it shows the, the key fluxes in the global carbon cycle, in and out of the land as a result of both natural photosynthesis and respiration, in and out of the land as a result of land management, and of course, into the ocean and eventually sequestration in the deep ocean, which is really the only safe place to put carbon in the very long term. Um, circa 1995, a key point here, the carbon cycle uh, structurally is basically the same, um, but if you look at a time series of these fluxes, you'll see the inexorable rise of the emissions, uh, uh, complicated changes to the pattern of land use fluxes. But amazingly, the overall land flux has stayed in almost perfect lockstep with the increase in atmospheric CO2. So if you look at this black line, that's the mass balance estimate of total land uptake from the Global Carbon Project. The gold line shows the rise in carbon dioxide. And this pattern continues to this day. There is a stunning proportionality between increasing CO2 in the atmosphere and increasing uptake by the land. And that red line shows the modeled effect of increasing CO2 on photosynthesis, on carbon sequestration due to photosynthesis, from a, a model ensemble of about 10 years ago. And there's very good reason to believe that this lockstep is not some kind of incredible coincidence associated with land use change, which several of my papers argued it was in the 1990s. Um, but it is really the result of carbon dioxide fertilization. Now, th there's good news and bad news in that, in that the best case world involves stabilizing carbon dioxide at something like doubled uh, pre-industrial concentrations uh, between 400 and 500 parts per million. And at those concentrations, everything we know suggests that global uh, GPP, global photosynthesis, will remain at a high level. But there's also bad news. Th these are two versions of, of the sort of structural equation that describes how increasing GPP results in increasing carbon stabilization. And it, it works that way because each year global GPP grows a little bit. It grows a little bit more than respiration. Um, assuming that there are not strong, complicated feedbacks between photosynthesis and, and ecosystem respiration that we don't understand yet. So the change in carbon, and this is from a very elegant paper uh, by Matt Thompson and Chris Field's group of about 20 years ago, the, the very simple equation says that, that the change in carbon storage is a function of GPP times the rate of increase in GPP times the residence time of the carbon that's produced. And this more elaborate form shows the relationship essentially expanding the R term to account for the relationship between the change in atmospheric CO2 relative to the, to the background of atmospheric CO2. And again, the thing that I want you to see is as R or as beta dCa dt over Ca of t, as that term goes to zero, carbon storage goes to zero. So as we stabilize carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, GPP will remain at an elevated level relative to pre-industrial conditions, but carbon storage with a time scale dictated by that tau term, which is probably globally somewhere sort of 40, 50 years, the carbon storage effect of that elevated CO2 will go to zero. And the, these equations are, are, are simple, but they underlie the very complex parameterizations for all of these terms in more complex models, including Century, which absolutely behaves this way. Um, and uh, 
And so there's good news and bad news. We can count on high agricultural productivity at high CO2, maybe crappy nutrition, but lots of, lots of carbon. Um, but we can't count on a continued subsidy from Mother Nature. And the ocean behaves exactly the same way for rather different reasons. Well, at, at, the, bottom of, at the bottom of it all, very similar reasons having to do with concentration gradients. Um, but the ocean subsidy will also slowly go away as we stabilize CO2. So as we move into a post-Paris world at 1.5 or 2 degrees above the present, we're going to be the driving force for carbon sequestration in the biosphere. And soil carbon is one of the critical sinks, along with reforestation, afforestation, and avoided deforestation. Um, it, it's critical to maintain terrestrial uptake will be up to humanity and not Mother Nature. When we look at the global carbon cycle, we typically look at tables like this. The left-hand two columns are very traditional. They come directly from the Global Carbon Project. They show the fluxes between the, if you will, the, the sphere of humanity, the land sink, the land use effects, the ocean, the atmosphere. Note the change in the airborne fraction. That's the percentage of anthropogenic CO2 that remains in the atmosphere after uptake by the land and the oceans. It does appear to be creeping up. There's a big debate in the literature about whether sinks are saturating or sources are increasing due to drought, wildfire, and so on, unclear. And on the right, we have evidence from our increasingly capable satellite remote sensors. So the fossil and cement emissions are constrained by co-tracers, uh, both reactive nitrogen and carbon monoxide. So the assimilation of those data begins with a, with a very strong prior estimate from bottom up estimates that are collected internationally. And it's then, uh, it, it, it's then assimilated into a model that adjusts that to take into account spatial gradients of other tracers. So we have a, a, an additional constraint. And you can see that most of the emissions are coming from the industrial northern hemisphere. Emissions in the tropical zone are growing. And the southern hemisphere is a very small contributor. Land use fluxes are increasingly well constrained by assimilation of radar, LIDAR, and image data. Image data providing sort of area-based change to land cover. Radar and LIDAR providing a constraint on canopy height and canopy biomass. We also use something called vegetation optical depth. The, basically the water content of the above ground vegetation. And so we can look at the distribution of land use changes, and we can see that it is absolutely dominated by deforestation in the tropics. We also invert, as it's called, the atmospheric gradients of carbon dioxide to estimate the net flux at the land surface corrected for the fossil fuel fluxes, but critically not corrected for the land use fluxes. And, and that, that's very important because if you look at what's going on, you see that there's a strong sink, 44% of the global sink in the northern hemisphere. And, excuse me, am, am I on the right row? Uh, land sink, 80% in the northern hemisphere, only a little bit in the southern hemisphere. What's going on in the tropics is that a very strong terrestrial sink is just about perfectly balancing that large land use flux. So the tropics are acting as a sink in a gross sense, but in the net sense, the tropics are at a tipping point where land use emissions and natural uptake just about balance. And varying from year to year, we can see as drought frequencies increase in the tropics, that balance increasingly tips towards net emissions somewhat significantly enhanced by the Bolsonaro effect. There's a wonderful article in the New York Times Magazine just this week 
from a, a great Brazilian scientist looking at, at, uh, at, at how the interaction of climate and policy has driven changes in the Amazon. So by combining traditional data sources and remote sensing, we can get a sense of the global carbon cycle. And we can produce maps that have, you know, r rather coarse resolution, finer for some characteristics, coarser for others. You can see we can do that for air sea CO2 exchange, net ecosystem exchange, which today honestly has a 500 to 1,000 kilometer footprint relative to vegetation biomass, which we can estimate down or below the one kilometer resolution level from space. And from these data, we can produce estimates of fluxes and stocks. And I, I want you to notice a pattern here that's very, very important. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit in the next couple of slides. These histograms are the number of FluxNet eddy covariance sites distributed globally. The, the best predictor of where they are is not where they need to be, not where the fluxes or the stocks are highest, but it's basically distance to a research university. You can see that the vast majority of flux sites are close to scientists. They're not close to carbon. And the high and low latitudes are also very difficult places to do this kind of technological work. So as I'll show you, space fills a very critical sampling gap in our understanding for carbon fluxes and vegetation. Can it do the same thing for soils? So here are just a selection of measurements made on the ground or from space as a function of the typical temporal resolution and the typical spatial resolution. So for example, the in situ CO2 network or the orbiting carbon observatory inversions give us sort of 500 to 1,000 kilometer resolution on sort of monthly to seasonal time scales. Solar induced fluorescence, a fairly direct measure of photosynthetic capacity, has sort of kilometer-ish resolution, and we might obtain that daily along with evapotranspiration from thermal imagery that we might get down close to the hectare level. Greenhouse gas emissions typically kind of weekly and at the hectare level because they come from individual plot, plant, city, road uh, inventories. Look at soil carbon change. Soil carbon change is out here. We can kind of measure typically sort of decadal changes at very, very small scales, right? I mean, each individual plot that we might resample is a few meters to a few tens of meters in size, and we all know how heterogeneous soil carbon is. Now, this is maybe an even more interesting plot. It shows the duration of our time series, the duration of the records that as a community we rely on as a function of the coverage of the globe that we obtain with sampling. And so what I've done here is for these lower three, um, there are about 500 reporting eddy covariance sites globally. If you look for a, an archive of soil profiles, there are about 800,000 of them that are easily accessible. And they cover 0.00 0.003% of the Earth's land surface. So that's the coverage that we have for soil carbon. Eddy covariance, because there are not very many of them, but they sample about a kilometer, I assume that each profile sampled about a meter. Um, we, we cover about 0.003% of the Earth's land surface. Forest inventory, there are about 4 million forest inventory plots. They're sampled somewhere between once a year, very commonly five years, and most often every 10 years. And they, and they cover um, about 0.003% of the Earth's land surface, a little bit better than that, double it, for the Earth's forested area. So these records are, are quite long. 
Um, there are soil carbon studies, not very many of them, that go back decades to look at soil carbon change. But then when we look at the remote sensing coverage, we basically have two clusters. We have instruments that are on the International Space Station that cover about 75% of the Earth's land surface. They're relatively short records. They're all less than or around five years. And then we have global remote sensing records on polar orbiting platforms. And the Landsat record, for example, goes back to when Keith and I were graduate students, so sort of dinosaurs still roamed the Earth. So how are we going to be able to use these different, very differently scaled, very different duration coverage resolution records together? Because there isn't any one of these approaches that's a Hail Mary pass that gives us all the information we need. We, we need. we need process studies at very local scales in order to understand what's actually going on, but we somehow need to understand how to use remote sensing that provides literally tens of millions of times more coverage in order to understand how these processes play out at global scales. And that, that, I think, is really the technical challenge that is probably most extreme for soils relative to all other ecosystem processes. Because A, you can't see them from space, except when there's no vegetation. And, and B, they vary at very, very small scales. What do models say? Global Earth system models simulate the dynamics of soils. They predict sustained uptake into even the RCP 8.5 climates, very hot, very dry climates, where based on what we're seeing in the world right now, all the vegetation is actually just going to die. They predict sustained soil carbon uptake into these very warm climates. They predict that the positive effects of carbon dioxide will continue or even grow into these very droughty, hot future climates. And observations that we're seeing today are showing climate impacts that are comparable to what most of the Earth system models predict for 2050. They're very optimistic about Mother Nature. Um, they predict that many of the models predict that the positive effects of increasing CO2 will outweigh the negative effects of drought, wildfire, and heat waves. In, in C2, by contrast, in C2 airborne and satellite studies are showing changes in the Arctic and in the tropics that are similar to that's, pro that's projected for 25 years from now. So the changes we're seeing now are, are at least 25 years faster than what today's Earth system models predict. There are several reasons for that. Many of these changes are due to changes in extreme, drought, heat waves, what resulting wildfire cascades of, of impacts that models with one degree or bigger grid cells just don't capture. So the models aren't necessarily wrong, but they're only capturing part of the response and they're not capturing, in some sense, the most critical part of the response. To the extent, for soils in particular, that one can compare sensitivities from experiments and observations, they're inconsistent with the parameterizations in these models. The models are, are using parameterizations that the authors admit are demonstrably at odds with, for example, global radiocarbon inventories. Most of the models predict reasonable geographic, zonal, this is a latitude versus carbon plot for soils uh, from a range of Earth system models. You, you can see that their prediction for stocks is clearly wrong because they're not simulating high latitude boreal and Arctic carbon storage. But their simulation of carbon densities is better. They understand that Arctic and boreal soils have high carbon densities, but they're not simulating the stocks correctly, presumably because of limitations to the simulation of carbon with depth, limitations uh, to the simulation of permafrost. And this is the state of the art. So in projections 
of that total carbon budget, the amount of carbon we can emit, those projections admit that there's a huge unknown associated with Arctic boreal soil carbon feedback that they just have to wave their hands about because it's not included in the models correctly. And th this is just a summary that into these RCP 8.5 world, soil carbon sequestration continues at about four tenths of a percent per year. That is absolutely inconsistent with soil warming experiments and the modelers know it. But their simple carbon budgets in the models, I mean very complicated, millions of lines of code, but very simple. Their parameterizations are not capturing the dynamic positive and negative feedbacks associated with carbon storage correctly. And you can see how that works. So these are simple experiments with a 1% per year increasing CO2, turning off and turning on the various controls um, in a protocol that's been around for a long time. So fully coupled means that the biosphere and the ocean see the CO2 and they see the temperature and hydro hydrologic cycle associated with changing climate. Biogeochemical, they don't see a changing climate. They just see continuing climate uh, at a constant level, but they see increasing carbon dioxide. And climate, they see the effects of increasing CO2 on climate, but the biosphere and the, and the ocean think that CO2 is constant. And you can see that the two upper responses are very large. They show that the biosphere and the ocean in these models is very sensitive to increasing CO2. And you can see that the response to climate is really quite muted. It's much smaller than the response. So of course these models are projecting that increasing CO2 will buffer most of the effects of warming and drying into the future. And this is almost certainly wrong based on observations that are being made today. It is almost certainly wrong. So the CO2 effect dominates over the climate effect. But when we look at the eddy covariance network, it doesn't show that at all. What it shows is something that was first, I think, classically proposed in a paper by George Woodwell that eventually the exponential dependence of respiration will win over the optimal dependence of photosynthesis on temperature. And in this paper by uh, Catherine Duffy et al., they argue that actually a significant fraction of the world's ecosystems are quite close to this tipping point and might tip over it with just a, a modest increase in temperature. Now, just for the amusement of the community that knows all about century. These are century simulations from the mid-1990s showing the response of a range of different ecosystems, photosynthesis with the optimal curve or actually net primary productivity, and respiration shown in the dotted lines. Now, in that version of the model in that era, as CO2 increased, there was an increase in resource use efficiency because foliar nitrogen went down. And so you see a sort of a stack there. But as foliar nitrogen went down, there was a litter nitrogen feedback that eventually brought respiration down by slowing turnover times. But the basic pattern is the same in that early simulation model, which is in a paper by Pierce Sellers and myself, as is now being observed by ensembling all of the eddy covariance sites. This is from a study inverting the changing seasonal cycle of CO2 in the Arctic. Um, the, the red shows uh, the ensemble distribution of residence times changes over about a 20 to 30 year time period based on the changing magnitude and phase of the seasonal cycle at high latitudes. And basically what this shows is the change in residence time is the diagnostic quantity in this model inversion. And what this shows for the basically the north slope of Alaska and northern Canada, what this shows is about a 13% reduction in residence time. That is, soils are turning over about 13% faster over this 30-year uh, time record. 
which is about twice what the mean turnover time prediction of our system models was. So again, we see this systematic set of biases between models and observations, but we're depending on these models to set targets for mitigation for climate management. And this is another, there are many ways of, of looking at the Amazon. I won't show today because the plots are very hard to parse. But the, the Amazon has changed over the past decade, more or less, from being on balance a net sink to, or, or neutral to being on balance a net source. And this shows the number of greenness pixels that are indicating signs in terms of their year-to-year -year variability of being near a tipping point, a transition, presumably between high productivity and low productivity. So there's good reason to believe that not only the Arctic being simulated incorrectly, low latitudes are as well. So in a post-Paris world, the driving force for sinks will slow and eventually go away. That is to say, the CO2 fertilization effect will lead to sustained high GPP, which is a good thing, I guess. Good for weeds, too. Um, but, but it, but at, at 1.5 degrees, I mean, imagine two-tenths to four-tenths of a degree global mean warmer than now. Well, now ain't so great. We're seeing extreme drought in much of the world at increasing frequencies and intensities. We're seeing cascading impacts through wildfire, flood, and a variety of other disturbances. We're seeing increased variability in yield and productivity. Um, so in a, in a successfully mitigated world, it's not a soft landing. The sinks will be due to us. We'll have to manage for sinks, and that's what this workshop is about. But we'll be managing against the counter pressure from increasing sources that are already increasing today and certainly will increase into the future. We're going to need active and creative management, and hopefully that's what will come out of this workshop. A number of US governments and the EU have talked about how you can't manage what you can't measure. And if there was anything that we can't measure, well, we can measure soil carbon perfectly, but we have real challenges in managing soil carbon change over meaningful time scales and at meaningful space scales. And we need better tools to optimize management that allow us to understand soil carbon change at scales that are meaningful for managing to the atmosphere over time periods that are meaningful to people, meaning you can't go to a farmer and say, I'll come back in 10 or 20 years and write you a check if you were successful, right? It's just not a meaningful, it's just not a meaningful management approach. So I, I think as a community, we have a much harder challenge than the avoided deforestation, reforestation, and afforestation crowd, because we can see trees from space, and we can count them one by one, actually. Th this is a real challenge, and I, I think that uh, this morning is our, is our kickoff. We're going to hear about a lot of aspects about how to address this. So I don't want to leave this as a Debbie Downer kind of a presentation. This is a hard challenge. This is a strong community. And I think this is the moment to begin addressing this challenge. So I'll wrap up there.